Let's look at technology trends and constraints and see how things are improving on a yearly basis. The focus here is on the, the logic design, the DRAM, and the I.O. So if you look at the integrated circuits with the logic, uh, the transistors count is obviously increasing. We're able to integrate more and more transistors as technology is scaling into lower dimensions. For example, if when we go from 32 to 22 nanometers, we're able to integrate more transistors. So obviously, the transistor count on the chip is increasing. It increases by 40%. This also allows us to increase the transistor density, right, for per, uh, uh, per, per millimeter square, which increases by around 35%. Today, we are also having uh, newer designs for transistors. That is, we can design transistors in the third dimension. And these are called fin FET. I think some of you might have heard it. And that also allows us to integrate more transistors. Now, the die size is also increasing 10 to 20 percent. Now, the die size is primarily a function of the pin count. So, for example, if you have more cores on the chip, you still need to deliver the power and you also need to take out the data from the chip. Right? So, the die size roughly increases 10 to 20 percent to accommodate those increases, right? the increase with the pin counts and so on. So, the logic is increasing the in you are, that is we are able to integrate more transistors on the on the chip and this trend is going to continue into the near future now if you look at the dram here the capacity is increasing by around 40 percent and which generally translates into doubling every two years now dram is a, a well-known technology it's a commodity a component that is it is uh, to store a bit you require a transistor and a capacitor. So the way you read, uh, write a bit is you, ch you store charge in the capacitor and the way you read the bit, you discharge that capacitor. Right? So it's very simple design. However, it doesn't scale in the same order because you now have a capacitor that has to scale. Right? So the DRAM circuits generally they scale around 40%. And today we are seeing some limitations with DRAM design. And as we go into the lecture, we will see what those limitations are and how we can work them. And that's why people are looking at newer technology like PCM, phase change memory, which can work with or even in the future replace DRAM and so on. Uh, the disk, the density is around 30% for now. We are able to put multiple disks. We can able, able to look into cylinders is what it is called when you read different sectors from the disk and so on. So we are able to increase the density uh, approximately 30% for now. Now, if you look at the signaling, and now this signaling generally refers to the bandwidth and latency to access data from these I.O. devices. And I.O. devices can be your flash drive, it can be your a hard drive, uh, even the network, everything comes on these buses, right? Now, you see little improvement in latency. The latency is a function of controller overheads, um, handshaking, handshaking protocols, and many other things that go play a big role uh, in reducing and not seeing so much of improvement in latency. Bandwidth is generally a function of the number of bits you can transmit and we are able to put more buses and we are able to increase the signaling speed also to a certain extent. So all of those contribute to having higher bandwidth but not so much improvement in latency. The next few slides we will see uh, different processor, uh, chip, layout, some of which is available. Pentium 4 for example you would see having around 55 million transistors. Now, the die size is around 146 millimeters square, right? So, this is a die size. It runs at around 3 gigahertz. It, it was introduced in 2000, right? Now, as we scale and we come to Intel Core i7, this is in 45 nanometers. And you can integrate 731 million transistors. The die size is roughly around 263 millimeters square. So, as you can see, we, we are not only integrating more transistors, the die size is also growing, right? It, it is increasing in proportion. This is the 15 core Xeon IV bridge from Intel. And this is in 22 nanometers. And we can have 4.3 billion transistors. Uh, the die size is around 541 millimeters square. So you can see the trend. We, we are scaling in technology that is allowing us to integrate more transistors. And our real estate is also growing a little bit. So I, 
our dies, our chip dimensions are slowly increasing. Of course, given that we have 4.3 billion transistors, it may not be possible to activate all of them at the same time, right? And the reason here being that the, there is a power density that one has to consider. And if you look at the power density, the whole dimension of the problem changes. And we'll see as we go further what are these, those problems. But power is today one of the biggest constraint for uh, uh, not achieving the performance we expect as we scale uh, to large processor counts and so on. So here is another chart which looks at the growth rates for the clock uh, and the transistors. So on the left, you have uh, the clock rates. For example, we can see uh, today the clock rates growing uh, at a rate of 30% per year. And this trend was pretty much true until we hit 2000, 2002, uh, when the clocking became a major problem because we were targeting to reach probably 10 gigahertz clock. As you know very well, even today we don't hit more than 2 or 4 gigahertz clock, right? And one of the reasons we saw, and this was in the Pentium series when they were starting to reach this 4 gigahertz clock, the, fre the, the frequency was so high that it affected the power, right? Because there's a direct relationship between the dynamic power and the frequency. And not only was the power a big constraint, the timing became a bigger problem. Right, the timing where we could ensure that the signal reaches the intended module or component in a timely fashion. So as the clock rate started increasing, we started lo seeing lots of problems in, uh, in clocking, in, in ensuring that the si uh, signaling is, is accurate, as well as uh, problems in, um, in power density. So that's one of the reasons why we started doing this multi-core because this became a problem here after 2000 and we started seeing many cores today with slower clocks, right? Today you can, you, you also get a choice, right? If you look at the clock, you get clocks which say 2 gigahertz to 2.8 gigahertz. So there is, there, is, there is some amount of tuning of those clocks, right? So that we can, we, can, we can boost some performance, we can save power and we'll talk about this as we go. Now on the right side, you see the transistor counts, right? We, we are going through the, we are exploding here and you know, we are hitting millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. I think we are in the range to hit billions, right? We just saw 4.3 billion transistors. So the transistor scaling is continuing. There is enough technology today to predict that we would easily go below uh, 10 nanometers, right? We can go up to seven and nine nanometers as is already models being developed. Uh, more than that, we don't know. We have, we have, we have to evaluate how, how. But at least for the next decade, we can see technology scaling and transistor counts yeah, increasing in our processes. Now, here is a big, you know, uh, a, a slide which talks a lot about the changes in technology in the architecture and how it led uh, to changes in applications and architectures and so on. So if you look at the 1970s, right, most of the focus was on multi-chip CPUs, right? We started looking at uh, designs with multiple chips, semiconductor memory was very expensive, right? So our, we started looking at uh, instruction sets where we could store complex instructions. And that was good because we, had, we, we didn't have enough space to store a lot of instructions, right? So the complex instructions made the storage simpler because we could store it easily. We had microcoded control to execute instructions and so on. Coming to 1980s, we started increasing transistor counts. So we went from 5K to 500K. We looked at a single chip pipeline CPU. So we had processors that were already pipeline. We had some amount of on-chip memory that is caches were possible. This still had simple hardwired control, simple instruction sets. Uh, probably one of the instructions that we started moving from was CISC, from CISC to RISC. It had small on-chip caches, the caches were small. The 1990s was when we started going into millions of transistors. So we have, you know, 1 million to 64 million transistors. Uh, we also started seeing some 64-bit CPUs from 32-bit. Uh, we also did complex control to exploit instruction level parallelism because 
To gain performance, we looked at clocking, which was which was true, transistor scaling, and the combined effects allowed us to do uh, to exploit parallelism at the instruction level. We started seeing some very deep pipelines, for example, Pentium pipelines were as deep as 10 to 15 uh, cycles, right? So, so the pipeline started 5 to uh, 5, 10 to 15 stages. We also started seeing multi-level caches, level 1 cache and level 2 cache and so on. Coming to 2000s, things changed further, right? So we started seeing 100 million to going up to now, we are in a, in a 5 billion transistors, right? Transistors are becoming a really big uh, uh, issue. We started seeing that the wires are slowing down, right, because of the R and C. The wires are a function of resistance and capacitance, and as you scale, they don't scale that fast. So wires are becoming slower, transistors are becoming faster. Power consumption is becoming a bigger problem. Uh, there's a design complexity, uh, memory latency is an issue, I.O. bottlenecks are, they, are, are, are uh, seen. And we started looking at multiprocessors and parallel systems, multi-cores. We needed support and we also need programming support mainly for uh, these multi-cores so that we can keep them engaged and busy uh, throughout. So some of the things here in 2000 is the transistor scaling, power consumption, these are bigger problems. The other issues that we have with this multi-core design is these parallel systems, we also need some programming and we need support for uh, these parallels. 